everyone. I'm Paul Lauritsen, uh, Director of the TUI Chair of Interreligious Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, and to um, kick off the uh, inaugural lecture of the uh, TUI Lecture Series this year. Uh, in a second, uh, Father Don Cousins will introduce our speaker, uh, but I just wanted to uh, extend a welcome on behalf of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies uh, and of John Carroll University. Um, and simply to, to say at the start that uh, we have been uh, very uh, fortunate to have Archbishop Fitzgerald with us uh, this year. He's been uh, a remarkable presence uh, to the department. Uh, we've asked him to do all manner of uh, things. Uh, I asked him to come into my class uh, at the last minute, uh, and he said, yeah, why not? Um, which, which is what uh, we've experienced with uh, Archbishop Fitzgerald, just uh, a wonderful uh, presence on campus, uh, and we are delighted to have him. Uh, here. Uh, as you know, the, the series is for the uh, tonight and the next uh, three uh, Monday nights, so we certainly uh, hope you'll come back and join us. Uh, so without any uh, further delay, uh, let me turn the podium over to Father Don Cousins, who will introduce uh, our speaker tonight. Thank you, Paul. I've just been told it's hard to hear in the back. Is that correct? Uh, I don't know if we can turn the volume up or not. Hello again. Any better? Thank you. We have with us this evening a true Vatican insider a long-time member of the vaunted Roman Curia. But I think you'll agree, Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald doesn't fit the mental image many of us American Catholics have of lifetime Vatican officials. And let me say why I think this is true. He has a twinkle in his eye. <laughs> He smiles easily. He doesn't take himself too seriously. And he's really interested in ordinary people. He's a good man to have a pint with. <laughs> but let me get on with it. Michael Fitzgerald was born in England to parents who immigrated from Cork, Ireland two years before his birth. He is one of four Fitzgerald children, and I think his family is quite interesting. Both of his parents and one of his sisters were medical doctors. In the Fitzgerald clan, it seems you tended to be a medical doctor or a bishop. <laughs> and at this point, I'd like to mention that Archbishop Fitzgerald's nephew, Michael Fitzgerald, and his wife, Syra are here this evening. Would you raise your hands and maybe say hello and welcome to you. And also traveling a considerable distance are two good friends of Archbishop Fitzgerald, Fred and Gloria Fry. So would you raise your hands? We're glad to have you here. You. Now Michael wanted to be a priest from about the age of 10. And as you know from the biographical sketch in the flyer announcing this year's TUI lecturer, a young Michael Fitzgerald entered the Society of Missionaries of Africa, popularly known as the White Fathers, and began his studies for the priesthood. Soon after ordination, he earned an STD from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And I should emphasize that the STD indicates a doctor of sacred theology for those of you who might be a bit confused. 
Now you might have noted from Michael's brief biography that after earning his doctorate in 1965, he earned a bachelor's degree with honors in Arabic from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Now his mother, Mrs. Fitzgerald, I've been told, was quite proud of her son earning his bachelor's degree from a real university. <laughs> Mrs. Fitzgerald, I want to say, do you think the Gregorian University hands out doctorates in theology like holy cards? <laughs> Archbishop Fitzgerald's numerous teaching assignments include Makerere University, Kampala, Uganda, and the Pontifical Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome. But Michael Fitzgerald made his mark, so to speak, as president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue from 2002 to 2006. And previous to this appointment, he worked closely for 15 years with Archbishop Francis Arinze, now Cardinal Arinze, as secretary for the Secretariat for Non-Christians, and that Vatican body was later named the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. In 2006, Archbishop Fitzgerald was named Apostolic Nuncio to Egypt and the Holy See's Delegate to the League of Arab States. This priest, scholar, humanist, diplomat, <coughs> An internationally recognized interfaith leader <coughs> is the co-author of two highly respected books and numerous scholarly articles. The scripture scholar Walter Rugelmann once wrote this, what we are about is serious conversation leading to blessed communion. <coughs> That's what the two-week lectures are about. And that's what Michael Fitzgerald is about. Serious conversation leading to blessed communion. Please welcome our man from the Vatican, Archbishop Michael Fitzgerald. Father Cousins, and for the presentation. And I would also like to thank the authorities of John Carroll University who invited me to be this year's TUI Chair Fellow. And thanks to Dr. Paul Lauritsen who has arranged this series of talks. And of course, I'd like to express my gratitude to the donors, to uh, Walter and Mary Tui, who uh, allowed this <coughs> chair to exist, a chair of interreligious studies. And I'm very privileged to be the, the fellow this year. In fact, the university has been very generous to me it allowed me to be almost free during the fall semester so that I could engage in my own research. And it is about the fruits of that research that I have been encouraged to talk to you tonight and over the coming weeks. I'm not sure that research is the right word, actually. What I was doing during the, the fall semester was preparing something for publication which I had already written many years ago. But I needed to go over it, I needed to put in references, footnotes and things. And, well, what I'm preparing for publication is in fact complete. And in January, I took a memory stick to Rome, where they're going to publish it, 
and <coughs> it's all right in the French. Uh, it's going to come out in French, but I'm not happy with the translation, which I did myself. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really have to go over the English. There are so many mistakes that I don't know how they got in. I think the French has been corrected and it's all right. Anyway, this book is uh, a series of meditations on the beautiful names of God. And each meditation starts with the Qur'an and then goes on to the Bible, both the Old Testament, or if you prefer, the First Testament, and then the New Testament. Now, first of all, I want to try to explain to you in this introductory talk uh, the reason for this enterprise and also the way of going about it. The most excellent <coughs> names belong to God. Use them to call on Him. The best names belong to Him. Everything in the heavens and earth glorifies Him. These verses from the Qur'an can, I think, be compared with what is said in Psalm 113 or 112, depending on your numeration of the Psalms. Let me quote this Psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time on and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. There is a similarity there with the Quranic text. So the Quranic text speaks in the plural about names, and here it is the name of God. But I think that we can take this idea of the names of God at the same time as a bridge, and an invitation. The names of God act as a bridge insofar as they establish communication between God and human beings. In other words, God expresses himself through his names. In a way, we can say that by this means, God comes to us. And through these names, we can go to him. That is the bridge part. But these names are also an invitation. An invitation, first of all, to praise. <coughs> Call on him, says the Quran. Praise the name of the Lord, says the psalm. So, an invitation to praise, but an invitation to imitation. Islamic tradition speaks of a tahalluk bi akhlaq Allah. That is to clothe oneself with the habits of God, or if you like, with God's attributes. So the invitation is to contemplate the names of God. And if God is just, then we also should be just. If God is merciful, we too should show mercy. If God is faithful, then faithfulness is our duty also. And in the Gospel we find a similar invitation, or in fact a command. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And here I'd like to quote a, a Muslim author, uh, a philosopher of Algerian origin, Abdul Nur Bidar. I don't fully agree with his fundamental thesis concerning the radical autonomy of the human person in relation to God, 
But I find this paragraph of his book interesting. He says, let us remember here that the God of the Qur'an has himself precisely defined that which forms his own flesh, in inverted commas. He's defined that which forms his own flesh through enumerating throughout the Qur'an a series of 99 names, each one more remarkable than the other. This is probably why the Qur'an, in fact, ceaselessly exhorts human beings to adopt an exclusive orientation and to meditate constantly and repeatedly on these names. While, on the contrary, it repudiates anything which could turn them away from this contemplation, associating something with God, impiety, hypocrisy, unbelief, etc. The Quran is constantly directing the gaze of human beings towards these perfect qualities and infinite capacities because it wishes to let it be understood that human beings have been made in order to appropriate them themselves. The final aim of meditation on the divine names <coughs> is to intensify their presence in ourselves, to develop progressively, generation after generation, their activity, their strength, and their fullness in ourselves. I find it interesting that Ab uh, Abdullur Bilar has himself emphasized the words to intensify the presence of the divine names in ourselves. In other words, this meditation on the names of God, we could say, has a practical aim. Of course, Christians might ask, what is the reason for this undertaking to adopt as the point of departure for a series of meditation the texts of another religion. And Muslims, <laughs> likewise, may wonder how the texts of the Bible concern them. The idea behind this venture is to encourage dialogue with the persons among whom we are living in a society which is becoming increasingly pluralistic. It's quite common now to speak of four kinds of interreligious dialogue. The dialogue of life, of living together in harmony and peace. The dialogue of action, cooperation in the service of our brothers and sisters. The dialogue of formal exchanges or organized discussions about religious topics or other topics of common interest, and the dialogue of religious experience, which has been described in the following way. A dialogue where persons rooted in their own religious traditions share their spiritual riches, for instance, with regard to prayer and contemplation, faith and ways of searching for God or the Absolute. The exercise in which I have been engaged I think falls into this last category. There is of course no direct sharing unless, as in this audience tonight, there are Christians and Muslims gathered together. Yes. But I would say that this collection of meditations is rather a literary sharing, a sharing of texts which come from the sources of Christian and Muslim spiritualities. <coughs> and in this context, I'd like to recall something written by Father Jean Mohammed Abdel Jalil. Jean Mohammed Abdel Jalil was a Moroccan Muslim 
who became a Christian and he was studying in Paris and who subsequently became a Franciscan friar. And in one of his books, The Aspect Interieur de l'Islam, the, in, the interior um, aspects of Islam, he said this, Certainly one of the best ways of understanding a people is to meditate on the texts they use for prayer. And to pray, starting from the texts of another religion, can therefore help us to acquire a better appreciation for this religion. Its riches can be discovered. <coughs> it may be that what we discover is not essential for the practice of our own religion, but it is possible that we shall find different echoes which may capture our attention and nourish our prayer. And this venture into the dialogue of religious experience has been undertaken by a group of Christians living in Algeria. A group of men and women who, for the most part, are members of different religious congregations. Having come to realize that constant reference to Islamic spirituality would help them to live their respective vocations in the midst of Muslims, <coughs> they formed an association which they called uh, the Ribata Salam the bond of peace. Now, this group would select a topic which each one of them was to investigate personally in the Quran and in other Islamic sources, as well as in the Bible. And then they would come together to share their discoveries once or twice a year. They would usually meet at the Trappist Monastery of Notre Dame de l'Atlas, in Tiberin, near Media, in Algeria. The following are some of the topics that they have covered over the years. Do justice and walk humbly with your God. <coughs> Living in an attitude of thanksgiving, Compassion, the language of the heart. Hospitality, as a fruit of compassion. And the example of this group, which still continues to meet, though no longer at Tiberin, since the massacre of the monks there, the seven Trappist monks who were kidnapped and then killed, they don't meet there anymore because the monastery is closed, but they do meet in other places. And this continuation of this uh, being, taking <coughs> the sources, taking uh, inspiration from Islamic texts has certainly <coughs> encouraged me to continue this reflection on the beautiful names of God. And yet, I would say there is a double pitfall to be avoided. On the one hand, care must be taken not to give a false interpretation to the meaning of the sacred books of other religions. In presenting the names of God as they occur in the Quran, an effort has been made to avoid a Christian reading of the Quran which would try to eliminate all the differences. The texts should be allowed to speak for themselves. At the same time, it's necessary to remain faithful to one's own tradition. And that's why in the meditations proposed in my book, and later in this month, the presentation of texts from the Quran is followed by texts from the Bible, as I've said, both from the First Testament 
and from the New Testament. And the hope is that the parallel presentation of these texts may touch both mind and heart. I started giving this retreat on the names of God some years ago, too many years ago, I would say. But I remember very clearly the first time I proposed these meditations to a group of my own confreres, missionaries of Africa, in Algeria. And before the retreat started, I suggested that each one should bring along a copy of the Qur'an. Well, one of the group reacted quite violently to this suggestion, saying categorically that he would not bring a Qur'an and that he would only take the Bible as the basis for his own prayer. But I think by the end of the week, uh, he had seen that it was reconciled to the method that I used. It was both Quran and Bible. During my last year in Egypt, so that was in 2012, I gave the same retreat to a group of Good Shepherd sisters, most of whom were Arabs. I think they were horrified at first that each meditation started off with references to the Qur'an. They were, of course, familiar with the Qur'an because they had had to learn verses off by heart when they were studying Arabic at school. But this was something that had been forced upon them. They really had very little curiosity about the spiritual resources of Islam. As far as I know, they enjoyed the retreat. At least no one walked out. <laughs> but this does raise a real question. Is it permissible to take inspiration from the texts of another religion? And in answer to that question, I would like to quote another text this time taken from the charter of the Groupe de Recherche Islamo-Chrétien, the Muslim Christian Research Group. This is a body of French-speaking Christians and Muslims who have been meeting and studying together since 1977. So they write, we do not think that the divine word, the foundation of our faith, belongs exclusively to us, whether we be Christians or Muslims. Christian faith is based on the person of Jesus and the witness of the apostles' faith as contained in the New Testament. But the historical phenomenon of Jesus of Nazareth and the texts of the New Testament writings are facts and documents available for investiga investigation by all. Similarly, Islamic faith is based on the Qur'an and on the authentic tradition of the Prophet. But the Qur'anic text and the life of Muhammad ibn Abdullah form part of the general history of the human race and belong to its spiritual heritage. This is why on both sides, with regard to the historical facts that ground our faith and with regard to our scriptures, we accept readings other than our own. Now these readings may provide us with a different understanding of the same term, of the same divine name. We may take it in different ways, because the resonances may vary according to the creed of each one. And here I think we can learn from the wisdom of an Anglican bishop, Bishop Kenneth Cragg, who died 
uh, two years ago, I think it is now, at the age of 99. We were preparing for his 100th birthday, but he celebrated it in heaven. And he had continued writing until he was almost 100. But Kenneth Cragg, in a very nice book, uh, Alive to God, Muslim and Christian Prayer, uh, had this to say. The words of a prayer should appear as spaces and not as prisons for our hearts. There is always the possibility that an agreement of terms, even with a difference with regard to their connotations, but with sincerity of heart, may grow and end up finally with a greater consensus. This that's the end of the quote. This consensus may, in fact, lead to communion. A communion beyond words, in shared silence. That is why we could take Father Brueggemann's words. Uh, what, is, what did you say? Um, conversation. Yeah, what we are about is serious conversation. Serious conversation leading to blessed communion. I think that's the aim here. In preparing these meditations, my aim has not been to provide a complete study of the names of God. For that, you would have to look elsewhere. But I would like to say a few words about what has been called this characteristic feature of Islamic religion, namely the eminent place which the divine names occupy in it. So according to tradition, there are 99 names of God. A hadith, that is a saying from the Prophet Muhammad, encourages the recitation of these names. And I quote this hadith. To God belong the 99 names, that is 100 minus 1. For he, the unique, and the unique in Arabic here is al-wit, which literally means the odd, the odd one. Not that God is odd, but he is odd in the sense of not being double. Or, or. So, let me start again. To God belong the 99 names, that is 100 minus 1, for he, the unique, loves to be designated by these names, enumerated one by one. He who knows the 99 names will enter paradise. Ah, that's a beautiful promise. As you know, the Muslims have a rosary, a rosary to, which will often be used as a support for the recitation of these names. The Muslim rosary, the subha, is made up of three times 33 grains, or often simply 33. 99, as is stated in the hadith, is 100 minus 1. Minus 1. The one missing name being the supreme name or the hidden name of God. And this implies that the names given to God in human language can never encompass entirely or exhaust the mystery of God. God will always remain greater. Allahu Akbar. God is greater. God is well beyond that which we conceive or say of him. And I think that is very important for us to remember. The 99 names which Islam gives traditionally to God are drawn from the Quran. Either directly or after having been formed from Quranic expressions. 
and particularly from verbs. For example, the Quran says that God is endowed with ilm, knowledge. Therefore, he is al alim. He is the one who knows. He is the one who knows everything. Uh, and so on. You can continue that process. We should note that a faithful Muslim is not authorized to invent names for God. When a popular Egyptian writer, Mustafa Mahmoud, who was in fact a medical doctor but who wrote spiritual books for the public, when he spoke of God as the architect, oh, this raised quite a hullabaloo. Uh, how can you say that about God? You're not allowed to do that. It's not in the Quran. Uh, so, in a way, that restriction puts a limit on the possible number of names for God. But in point of fact, there are far more than 99 names which can be derived from the Quran. The theologian Ghazali, often considered to be the Thomas Aquinas of Islam, includes in his study of the beautiful names a short chapter on explaining that the names of God Most High are not limited to 99 so far as divine instruction is concerned. And one scholar, our colleague Zeki uh, Saritoprak, who is here present, uh, has calculated that there could be more than 130 names of God that we can derive from the Qur'an. There are, in fact, several lists of 99 names, each with variants. The list which I have used as a basis for my reflections, represented in the form of a lamp, I don't have it here, the Arabic is nicely done in the form of a, a lamp, would appear to be a list uh, going back to uh, the 9th century, 810, Walid ibn Muslim al-Dimashqi. But that list, he made it, but it goes back to a companion of Muhammad. The list that I used ends with the following prayer. <coughs> My God, Indeed, I am your servant, the son of your servant, the son of your handmaid. My forelock is in your hands. Your judgment concerning me is decisive, and your decree is just. I therefore beseech you by each one of the names that belong to you, which you have chosen for yourself, or which you have revealed in your book, or which you have taught to one of your creatures, or the usage of which you have reserved to yourself, according to the knowledge you have of your own mystery, to render the glorious Qur'an true nourishment for my heart and light for my vision. May it dispel in me all sadness and remove from me every worry and affliction. Amen. So that is how a Muslim sees this meditation on the names of God. as something that can sustain and nourish and encourage. It wasn't really possible to reflect on all the 99 names of God in a series of eight meditations prepared for a retreat. So I selected some of them, and I selected them, grouping them according to the following plan. One, the creator who upholds his creation. Two, the transcendent God, God's inner being. Three, the imminent God, God with us. Four, the God of love and pardon. Five, 
the Almighty King. Six, the God who guides. Seven, the generous God. And eight, the God of peace. Now this choice and this arrangement was made keeping in mind the general flow of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Everything begins with God, the Creator, the source of all being. This is the foundation and principle of our reflection on the purpose of life. Yet although God is manifested through creation, the transcendence of God is to be respected. And yet, this doesn't take away from the imminence of God, who is always, in biblical terms, Emmanuel, God with us. Human beings have nevertheless to come to terms with their own weaknesses, their sinfulness. <coughs> yet far from this separates awareness of sin separating them from God, it leads them to perceive God as the God of love and the God of pardon. And it is this same God of love who, as king, calls them to service, to humble service. The exact form of this service has to be discerned. And for this, there is need of God's guidance. In fact, the adoring servant of the Lord needs to be constantly guided by divine favor. And since God is the most generous, this favor of divine uh, guidance will never be lacking. And following divine guidance, following along the path the Lord indicates, will lead finally to an enjoyment of that peace which God has promised to all who prove themselves to be faithful servants. I was happy to see that both of the persons who were invited to write a foreword to this collection of meditations picked up this reference to Ignatian spirituality. There are two forewords because there's one in French and one in English. My confrere, Claude Roux, missionary of Africa, who is Bishop of La Guatte in the Sahara, who was actually my student, and who is a former novice master, familiar with the task of initiating our candidates for the Society of Missionaries of Africa into the dynamics of the spiritual exercises. He wondered if this reference had been included simply as a way to reassure the Christian reader. But he pointed out that it conveniently highlights the intention behind the study, which is spiritual in nature. The aim is to invite Christians to make a retreat while being nourished with what gives life to those who are searching for God according to the Islamic tradition. And he says the method of presentation adopted makes this approach easier while enriching it with the tradition of spiritual Muslims. And he adds the following reflection. Before founding the Jesuits, St. Ignatius of Loyola, laid up on account of a wound received in battle, went through a strong inner experience which led him back to his own depths. And it is there that he discovered his Lord. Having arrived at this point, he translated his own experience into what we call these spiritual exercises a way proposed to those who wish to put themselves at the school of the Lord. The more personal we are, the more universal we become. It is in our own depths that we discover what is universal. 
Those are not my words, those are the words of Claude Rowe. For his part, Archbishop Kevin MacDonald, retired Archbishop of Southwark in England, in south of the Thames in London, who was retired because of health reasons, but who is still in charge of interfaith relations in England and Wales, he makes the following remark. In an Ignatian retreat, we do not study the scriptures in an academic way. Rather, we allow the scriptures to speak to us. We look for wisdom and enlightenment. For a devout Muslim, the beautiful names of God are an endless source of enlightenment and edification. They are an invitation to deeper praise of God. <coughs> In these meditations, the Archbishop, he's referring to me, selects some of these names as they occur in the Qur'an and explains their significance for Muslims. He then goes to passages in the Old and New Testament which have particular affinities with these texts. The reader is simply invited to be open and receptive to the wisdom and to the invitation that this experience offers. Now I'm aware, very aware, that some important names of God have not been treated in my meditations. Important names such as Al-Haq, the truth, reality, or Al-Adl, the just one. Either they've not been considered or they've only been mentioned in passing. <coughs> but each meditation begins by presenting some of the names of God as found in the Quran and then looks at similar themes in the Bible, as I've said, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. At times the names in the Quran may be considered in a somewhat isolated fashion. By that I mean making abstraction of the context in which they are found. The context which could contain <coughs> statements that go against Christian beliefs. And I hope that that will be excused. I think in fact we act in a similar way with regard to the Psalms and other books of the Old Testament when we leave out certain verses which clash with our Christian sensitivity. In some cases, the reflection on the names will lead to the discovery of different emphases, and even to names which don't occur in the Quran. One such example is shepherd, God as the shepherd. You don't find it in the Quran. One final observation, this is an introductory talk. Uh, these texts are proposed not as an object of study, but in order to foster meditation. And yet, just as it can be useful to pay attention to the Hebrew or to the Greek when looking at scripture texts, so recourse to the original Arabic can help to illuminate passages from the Qur'an. I'm going to give you an example, just one. One finds in the Qur'an that two names for God are constantly linked together. وَعَالَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ Remember that God is self-sufficient, worthy of all praise. Well, the term Rani, which in common parlance means rich, is, I think, here translated correctly as self-sufficient. God is not in need of anything. He doesn't even need our praise. 
And this may call for us, Catholics, the fourth common preface for the Eucharist in which we find these words, you, God, you have no need of our praise, yet our desire to thank you is itself your gift. Our prayer of thanksgiving adds nothing to your greatness, but makes us grow in your grace. If we meditate on the names of God, it is not in order to give pleasure to God, but rather because God has something to give us. And here I think the words of the Fatiha, the opening surah or chapter of the Qur'an, come to mind. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. It is you we worship. It is you we ask for help. So we are looking towards God only, but we are receiving from God. In the following talks, the two lectures, each Monday evening at the same time, I think, you know, I'll do a little bit of uh, propaganda here. <laughs> so uh, today is the 9th, on the 16th, on the 23rd, and on the 30th. Uh, uh, I will present some of these meditations. So they're going to be meditations. This may be good for this season of Lent. But to end this introductory talk, I would like to give you an initial meditation on the God who reveals himself to us. And you have the text on the paper that you can hand. So, first of all, a text from the Qur'an. It's in Surah 20, the verses 8 to 14. God, there is no God but him. The excellent names belong to him. Has the story of Moses come to you, prophet? He saw a fire and said to his people, Stay here, I can see a fire. Maybe I can bring you a flaming brand from it or find some guidance there. When he came to the fire, he was called Moses. I am your Lord. Take off your shoes. You are in the sacred valley of Tua. I have chosen you, so listen to what is being revealed. I am God. There is no God but me. And keep up the prayer so that you remember me. Oh, a few remarks on this text. First of all, we see that Moses is driven by his curiosity. And curiosity, according to popular wisdom, is the beginning of knowledge. But Moses wants to find out, what is this fire? What is the nature of this fire? And because of that, he accepts to be taken out of his way we could say, to go out of himself. But he thinks of his family. He said to his people, ah, that is his family, wife, children, so on. He thinks of them. Because, he says, I might be able to bring a flaming brand, so they themselves could let them light a fire and find warmth and cook on this fire. But, he says, he might also find direction, huda, find the right direction. In the material sense, this might mean being told which way to go in order to find water and a good camping place. But there's also a spiritual sense namely to go in the right direction along the straight path, as indicated in the Fatiha, the opening surah of the Qur'an, guide us 
along the straight path. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim And having reached the fire, Moses receives a personal invitation. He is addressed by his own name. And the one speaking to him establishes with him a personal relationship. I am your Lord. Moreover, this meeting entails purification, for Moses finds himself in a sacred place. He also discovers that he has been chosen by God for a mission that will soon be entrusted to him. But before speaking, he must listen, and he must be careful to give worship exclusively to the one God. Now let's consider the parallel text in the Bible, which is probably more familiar. It's a bit longer. Bear with me. Moses was <coughs> keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not turned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestor has sent me out to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So we find here, as in the Quranic texts, the same curiosity on the part of Moses, which leads him to make a detour. The invitation that is addressed to him, the purification that is required, and the mission that is given to him also. But there are differences. The event takes place at the mountain of God. In the Quranic text, it is in the valley of Tua, but Tua is interpreted maybe as being uh, Mount Sinai, Tua. All right. Important thing in the text of Exodus the fire is not consumed. And Moses answers God. When his name is called, he answers, Here I am. That could perhaps remind us of the young Samuel in the book of first book of Samuel, when he is called in the night and he goes to Eli to say, Who you called me? It is the Lord who is calling him. He responds. 
We could also perhaps think of Mary, who at the time of the Annunciation pronounced her fiat to God's messenger, Gabriel. And we see also in the text of Exodus that God reveals himself as the God who intervenes in history. He is the God of the past, because he is the God of the ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is a God of the present, because he has seen the misery of his people. And he is a God of the future, because he entrusts Moses with a mission for the future, the near future. And Moses is to accomplish this mission in the strength of the Lord, the strength of his name, I am who I am. Or in other interpretations, I will be what I will be. I think from these texts, it is possible to draw some guidance which may help in following the meditations which are to come. Coming to these talks may demand an effort. Time has to be set aside for this purpose. And it could be said that those who come have to make a detour, have to do something special in their own daily timetable, like Moses. Meditating on the names of God also demands a certain degree of purification, for one is approaching a holy place. <coughs> One is coming nearer to God. And one has to accept to remain in this place, even if at times it can seem rather arid, like a desert. Shoes or sandals have to be taken off as a sign of respect. But also, I would say, as a sign of the desire to remain in the presence of the Lord. Barefoot, one is not really ready to leave. It's possible also that in the course of these meditations, God may address a personal invitation to the one who is meditating. In this case, one should be attentive to what the Lord is asking, to the mission that he is entrusting a mission which goes beyond the person of the individual to those to whom he or she is being sent. It is by God's favor and grace that the mission is entrusted. And it is through the grace of God that it will be accomplished. And here we have the mystery of the burning bush. The fire which does not consume symbolizing energy which is never spent, symbolizing the love of God. If we trust in our own energy, in our own limited human strength, we shall soon be exhausted, burnt out. We are called to empty ourselves in order to leave room for divine energy, which is the source of all goodness and well-being. That is the end. So we have time for uh, some questions, which Bishop Fitzgerald uh, said he was happy to take them. Um, unfortunately, we have only one wireless uh, mic, um, so I will be running around to various parts of the room uh, trying to get this to you. So um, uh, let us take questions. It would be way back there, thank you. 
Thank you for that talk, Your Excellency. That was really a nice start to this month's lectures. Uh, the historian in me was surprised, both on the handout and then when you revealed that it's the pattern you use on retreat, that the Quran always comes first, and then either the Hebrew or Christian Testament, because of course, historically, they were inspired and written Hebrew Testament, Christian Testament. Quran separated by at least about 1,500 years. So um, I know you said explicitly you're not looking at them historically, but I wanted to hear more about the spiritual value of meditating first on the Muslim text and then on the Judeo-Christian text. I think it's probably a practical decision that you're in a retreat, and the retreat is meant is for Christians. That is, I, I don't think I've ever given this retreat where there have been Muslims present. So I would think that if it started in the, you know, the historical way, if you started with the, the First Testament and then the New Testament, the people would have had enough by, by that, and then would, would, uh, would, they wouldn't pay any attention to the Quranic part. So, the, uh, taking the, the names of God, and of course we get this list of names of God from the Islamic tradition, not from the Christian tradition. So we are starting with something in the Islamic tradition. But I think that the idea is to, in a sense, to present something a little bit different and to capture the attention of people so that the, the scripture texts then, in comparison to the, the Qur'an, take on a, a, new, a new dimension, if you like. So it, it's, you're enriching what has gone before with what has come afterwards. In a way, maybe Muslims would be quite happy with that because they would find it as the the the, the Quranic text confirming what is <laughs> what has gone before. Uh, that that's not exactly the intention. I think the intention is to to uh, capture the attention of people. I'm not good at storytelling and or jokes. You know, uh, there are retreat preachers who always start with a joke, um, but but I'm not good at that. But, but here is something more substantial, I think, which can help to uh, allow people to put themselves before God in a different way. But as I said, this, this man who reacted quite violently to my suggestion that he should bring a Quran to his own eight-day retreat, annual retreat, um, they are free to meditate afterwards on whatever they want. And they, they have texts from our scriptures that they can meditate on if they want. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, um, completely novel to me, and uh, so maybe you could shed a little bit of light. Um, it, it struck me that um, in the Quran, when uh, God approaches the prophet, he immediately says, I have chosen you, and listen. Whereas in, the, uh, in Exodus, God calls Moses' name, and he immediately speaks. And I was just curious in your meditations if that's, you can eliminate all that. Idea. So in the, in the Quran, he doesn't, uh, I have the uh, text. I have it with me, actually. He does, he does call, he calls Moses eh, in the Quranic text as well. He calls out to Moses. Uh, yeah, yes, and then says, listen to what I have to say. God says to Moses, listen to what I have to say. But yet in Exodus, God calls out and Moses immediately responds. Yes. Actually, I, I think that is why I put in the, the, the you know, like Samuel, who is saying, uh, I'm, I'm here, or Mary, who says, Fiat. If you look at the, um, 
parallel text of the Annunciation in the Quran, um, Mary responds to the, the angel, but there is no fiat. She doesn't uh, say, let it be. It's going to be because God has decided. In other words, uh, the, God doesn't need the response of the human being. So he doesn't need Moses' response, I, here I am. He, he speaks to him anyway and says, listen. That, that, that's, that is how I see the difference between the two texts. So there's, um, there's less a, a human response, if you like, a human participation in what God has decided that he is going to do. Uh, the, the person, Moses, is called as the prophet to intervene, and he's going to do it. And God is going to help him. And God, so, but he doesn't have to say, uh, oh, all right, I will go. He's going to go. I think that, that's how I see the difference. Some people there. Yes. Sibi, salam alaikum. In view of the pre previous question about the chronology of either the Exodus comes first or the Torah comes first, there is a misconception, and I would like for it to be a question. Misconception is that we think of Islam as a denomination. As? As a denomination. As a denomination. Yes. Therefore, since the, denominationally, it came after Christianity and so forth. But Islam is a human condition, a condition of the human uh, the creation of God. And we think, as Muslims, we think that all the prophets are Muslim. The condition is subject to, Muslim means submitted to the word of God. It does not mean that you belong to it. Remember, that prior to World War II, I think, most people, most not Westerners or non-Muslims used to call us Mohammedans. Mohammedans are not used anymore because they found out that we do not worship Muhammad. Remember what Umar ibn Khattab had said, if you have been worshiping Muhammad, Muhammad is now dead. But if you worship God, God is eternal. That has been the basis of Islam all along. So we say, we, Jesus was Muslim because he submitted to remember the day of the cross, he, he said, he quoted him saying, my father, why have you forsaken me? Well, the, it's, it's a condition uh, not only to God, he made this that way. So it is interesting that we compare it with, we say, since Exodus was first, that we, should, we think that um, Quran has imitated no, it's saying the, this message is about the human condition at given times where the level of civilization, the le level of concern by humanity was different for different ages. And if you notice, for when we talk about this, this creation of having taken six days and seven days he rested, which is, they're not 24 hour days. They are, we, we, you have the ice age, you have the various ages. So the days that we have, we, when we consider it from the human point of view currently, then we were influenced by the chronology of it. And so that's why I want to say that Islam is a con the condition of the human being toward God. He submitted to the will of God willingly, cheerfully, and, and understandably it should be. Thank you. Thank you for the reflection. I, I yes. Um, Arabic in which the Quran comes to us, comes to humanity. Um, this language doesn't have capital letters. There are no capital letters. So uh, when you say Islam, it can mean actually different things, as you say. It can mean this, this attitude of loving and submission to the creator God, who is the judge. That, that, and that. I would say that Jesus is the perfect Muslim in that sense. He, he's, 
doing always the will of the Father. But there is also an Islam with a capital I, because this attitude, if you like, has developed into a religion with its own laws, its own rights, its own, and, and that is Islam with, with the capital. But, but we have to remember also the fundamental attitude which is there in the Islam with the capital letter. Which, if it doesn't have that, then it, it's, it's useless, eh? one would say. You know, if, it, if it's only outward observance without this inner attitude of submission to God, then what is the value of this? But the, it has developed into a different religion uh, separate from the religions that were there before, Judaism and Christianity. Uh, perhaps we could take uh, one last question. I'm interested in the um, uh, complexities of the Exodus reading in terms of the name of God. Um, you would have, apparently in the Hebrew, um, the word God is a kind of generic. Um, but then you have Yahweh, in some sense seems to be more of a personal name for God. Um, but then, it's not pronounced in the Jewish tradition. It's, in fact, transformed into another word with different vowels, Adonai, the Lord. Um, I guess I'm interested if Islam, the name God, is more like Elohim, God, the generic, or does it have any connection to a more personal name like Yahweh, um, and then, I guess I'm wondering, in those 99 names, in Islam, do people use those as direct address to God? You know, my sustainer, I don't, I don't know what the 99 names are, but do, are those used to address God, or are they more descriptor, descriptors, or uh, description of God's being or God's actions? Well, I think I would have to say, come back to the other talks. <laughs> um, but in, in, in the name, let's say that the usual name for God in the Quran is Allah, which is really a contraction of the article and ilaha, which means the divinity. So this is the divinity, beside which there is no other, la ilaha illallah. And, and, but we have a text in the Quran, and it is, I will quote it as well, where another name is used, a Rahman, which is the, the one who is absolute goodness, or mercy, whichever you like to translate it. And uh, the text is, uh, call, call upon Allah, or call upon a Rahman, it is the same God. Obviously there was some difficulty, because a Rahman was, came from the south of Arabia, this name, and was not known around Mecca, whereas Allah was the, the, the name that was known. And, and here the Qur'an is saying, it doesn't matter which name you call God with. But in a sense, none of the names will exhaust the, what God is. And none of the names can say what God is. They, they will say some of the, more of the actions of God, as you, you suggested. Than, though Rahman is the one who has goodness in in himself, and Rahim, which is from the same root, is showing that goodness to uh, all the whole of creation, if you like. Um, do 
yes, I think Muslims do in their devotions, they can use different names for God. Uh, ask, ask the Muslims here present. Um, I, I would doubt if, you know, with the, with the rosary, with the tasbih, which they have these 99 beads or 33 beads, I would doubt if they are saying the whole 99 names of God. I'm not sure that all Muslims know the 99 names of God off by heart like that. But they would repeat or a phrase to God, I seek pardon from God, or, or you know, they, they, they would be using these beads. Now, sometimes people use them just as worry beads, you know, so you see Christians in the Middle East with these beads as well, and they're not praying on them, they're just using them to, to get rid of their tension, you know. They're, uh, they're annoyed with their boss or something like that, or they feel that they should be going and it's time to go. Uh, uh, but, so they use their rosary. Uh, um, but I, I think that you, you do see uh, pious Muslims with their rosaries going along the road and they're, and they're you know, slipping them through their fingers. And I'm sure they're, they're repeating an invocation to God. And uh, I would think that the um, particular different names of God can be used for this as well. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and please join me in thanking you.